right, all right, all right. Um, we are moving on to optical microscopy, which is the topic we'll be talking about today. Um, I have the eye of Sauron um, kind of representing optical microscopy because the eye of Sauron, of course, sees all. Um, that's how my eyes felt after uh, riding my bicycle through the wildfire smoke and uh, maybe not the best decision. Uh, but optical microscopy, um, it's a pretty uh, common tool used throughout the sciences, actually. And uh, there's some differences between the uh, microscopes uh, that we use as metallurgists and uh, microscopes in other uh, scientific fields or optical microscopes that individuals in other scientific fields uh, may use. And uh, the, again, the instrumentation that we use uh, to perform optical microscopy um, is an optical microscope. And when you go um, and ask someone, if you just ask a random person on the street, hey, uh, you know, what do you think a microscope looks like? Um, in most cases, they, they kind of think of this. So this is kind of the stereotypical uh, microscope. And it's generally used for biological applications and our biological-like applications. And um, let me change my pointer. And uh, we have a movie. So this is uh, my dining room. Uh, turned it into a lab. And uh, so we have a biological microscope. Um, it has a light source so you can reflect ambient light or use a, a lantern kind of light or flashlight type of light. Uh, we have the sample stage. Um, we have different objective lenses, uh, which is actually pretty cool. Um, it's a kid's microscope, but it's uh, actually a lot of fun. And uh, you have different objectives. And then you have an eyepiece. And the total magnification, we'll see a slide on this later, um, is the uh, magnification of the eyepiece plus, plus magnification of the objective. Uh, you have a way to manipulate the focus or manipulate the working distance, uh, which will change depending on the objective. And uh, we'll see that um, a little bit more. Um, better pause it there, my dining room again. Um, the fold scope. Um, is another kind of biological microscope. And you guys saw a TED talk on the fold scope um, earlier in the semester. Um, it's kind of cool. And uh, sometimes I, I have um, these handed out in class. And uh, so we're doing it online. So uh, you can see one I, I put together at home. Um, the back end opens up and then you put your uh, specimen in there where I showed it. And I have another video uh, showing putting in the specimen. And uh, you can actually hook the uh, cell phone, like connect your cell phone to that end and actually record your image. So you have an image recording uh, capability uh, for the fold scope. And um, interaction of light with matter um, is kind of what we're gonna start talking about first. And so biological microscopes, uh, like the two that we saw just now, um, they generally rely on the transmission of light through the specimen. So they, the interaction of light with matter in this case would be transmission and in some some degrees absorption as well but in general it's a it's transmission um, we have uh kind of showing this let me get to the let me get it so it's visible because that might be easier than going back and forth uh, between the laser pointer um, so biological microscopes, again, relying on transmission of light through a microscope slide. And uh, here we have, again, the kind of the, um, it's actually a pretty good child microscope, actually. So we're putting the slide on the, on the stage of the instrument. And I kind of got out of the focus. I was using my phone to make this video. Um, there you go. So the slide goes there. The light bounces from uh, the mirror up through the specimen, and then you, you get your image. Um, the fold scope, um, I have the slide in there already. I've taken it out, again, out of the focus of the camera. I apologize, but I, hopefully you get the idea. And uh, so you put the slide into the instrument. And so there's a hole there um, where the light's going to pass through, and it'll go through to the other side, and then you can see it either with your eye or with your cell phone. So again, um, these... Um, my microscopes are generally relying on transmission of light through your specimen. And in particularly, the design of the biological microscope um, was actually the template by which a transmission electron microscope was designed. And we'll see that uh, when we get into electron microscopy. Um, 
I like these types of microscopes also, um, these so-called kind of USB digital microscopes. And you can get them pretty much anywhere. Uh, you can get them off Amazon. I got this one off Monoprice. It's actually a pretty decent quality uh, microscope. And uh, this one is uh, relying um, on reflection of light off the surface. And it's kind of like a magnifying glass if you think about it. So when you look through a magnifying glass, light's bouncing off what you're looking at, going through the lens and hitting your eye. <clears throat> Here, I've uh, connected the, the microscope to the computer, and uh, it's actually a tablet, and um, we're actually just seeing the grid. And uh, we'll see uh, this microscope uh, later on to kind of uh, illustrate some other concepts uh, that are pertinent to optical microscopy. Um, I like these. Uh, there's several models uh, like this floating around. You can get these off Amazon pretty easily. Um, it's a microscope that actually hooks up to your cell phone. And uh, this one is actually kind of cool. It has two different illumination sources. So you have white light, then you actually have UV light. So you can actually change the wavelength of the light that's hitting your specimen. Um, it has this kind of handy dandy uh, little um, connector. Um, it's almost like a clothespin, if you will. Um, it screws to the microscope if I can do it. And uh, it then attaches to your cell phone and you just line it up with the camera on your phone. Um, this works with pretty much any phone. Um, if you have an iPhone, they actually sell some cases that have an integrated uh, thread. So you can screw a microscope to your iPhone. And uh, that's mainly because there's generally one model of iPhone per every six months, maybe two if you have a big one and a small one, maybe now three with cheap. But there's like you know a billion Android phones. I'm an Android user, so no offense. Um, so that's why I have this kind of universal type of clip. Um, it attaches to uh, the phone uh, quite easily, and uh, so you can actually use it. It's, it's actually pretty useful. I've, I've gotten actually usable images off of uh, these types of instruments, and uh, here I'm taking, uh, and you can actually change the focus if I didn't mention that already, um, taking a sim, or not sim image, microscope image of the wood grain of my, my dining room table there. Um, and this, again, also relies on a reflection uh, so reflection of light off of your uh, specimen. Um, as metallurgists, so most of us are, are metallurgists um, in this class, uh, we use uh, the so-called inverted microscope. And like these USB microscopes I just showed and uh, the one that attaches to your cell phone, um, it also relies on reflection of light off the specimen. And uh, this was invented um, I, a while back and it was invented by Bain. It, well, it's the wrong, the wrong Bain. Um, wrong Bain, sorry about that. Actually, Edgar Bain, um, for which the phase Bainite um, is named for, actually invented the inverted microscope. And uh, he was a U.S. Steel employee and um, very interested in uh, what the effect of processing and alloying was doing to the microstructure. Um, if you've ever seen someone try to uh, perform metallography using a biological microscope, and I've actually witnessed this, um, it's, uh, it's pretty funny, actually. And, and uh, so it's always, you always want to use an inverted microscope for uh, light optical microscopy and or metallography. And uh, you see there are some similarities, and I'll, I'll kind of point it out. I didn't kind of tailor the slide to this. Um, there's a whole other video uh, that we have on uh, performing optical metallography. And, uh, and I'll mention that again in this lecture uh, that I've posted and, and I suggest you watch. Uh, but you also, and just to make sure we uh, have a pointer, um, you also have a rotating uh, kind of carousel of objective lenses. And uh, you still have your eyepiece. This is kind of an interesting microscope because so you can put a digital camera in here so you can see at the same time um, maybe not at the same time. You can zoom in your image because it looks like this one has uh, um, apertures and uh, mirrors that you insert and pull out. But anywho, um, you have similar things. So you have your specimen stage, you have your objectives, and then you have your eyepiece. And if I've not mentioned it before, the total magnification is the magnification of your objective um, plus the magnification of your eye, or times the magnification of your eyepiece. And I'll mention this again. So if this is you know, 20x and this is 10x, um, 10 times 20 is 200. So you have 200x um, there. Um, so we've talked about transmission, uh, we've talked about reflection, and so I think it would behoove us 
to uh, talk about interactions of light with matter, I kind of uh, spilled the beans a little bit. Um, but reflection, refraction, absorption, polarization, diffraction, and transmission are the main interactions of light with matter. And um, let's kind of talk just a little bit about uh, each one of these um, reflections. Uh, maybe I should you know, look at myself in the mirror uh, more often and fix my hair or something. Uh, but we see that every day, um, mostly if we check ourselves out in a mirror. Um, reflection, it is, hold on, dealing with my pointer. Um, reflection, uh, actually, in, it's, it's an interaction of light with the surface. So the light basically bounces off the surface. And uh, the surface texture um, actually plays a big role, as does the material type. And we'll get into that shortly. Uh, but the texture of the material has a big, big um, influence on how uh, we perceive um, the light bouncing off the surface. So a very, very smooth surface. So think of a polished mirror finish. The, the light's going to behave differently when it bounces off of that surface. If you have a very, very rough surface, it's going to look different. And if you've ever done optical metallography, you actually can witness this change uh, from a rough surface to a smooth surface. Um, if, if just by doing the process. And again, um, you'll see a little bit more about optical metallography um, in the supplemental video. Um, here, I didn't, I didn't put optical metallography. I put uh, my old friend conductive ink and I have a printed silver uh, ink trace. And um, the microstructure um, here uh, have a lot more smaller particles. These are uncentered uh, grains of silver, basically, or particles of silver colloids, if you will. And it's a lot more dull. Um, here you have bigger grains, if you will. Okay, so they've centered uh, much, much bigger. So the light's going to behave differently. Uh, this is effectively smoother. And uh, let me make sure I have the pointer. Um, oopsie. I apologize. Um, this is effectively smoother than this. So the corresponding, uh, this is a photograph. These are SEM micrographs. Um, so the microstructure actually plays a big role in uh, how the light's going to bounce off your, your piece here or your, your object. And so here we can see it's brighter and here it's duller um, on these uh, kind of bond pads, if you will. So reflection. Um, reflection, we generally use an optical microscopy uh, for mirrors and on that biological uh, microscope you saw, you saw you had two choices of a light illumination. So you could use a light bulb um, or you could just reflect ambient light up through your specimen. And uh, so material selection of mirrors is uh, kind of a, a topic um, that, that kind of becomes important. And so if you have like these four uh, choices of metal, so copper, gold, silver, and aluminum, and uh, you choose these silver and copper may be a little questionable because silver and copper uh, rust or tarnish, if you will. They grow oxides, so they, they tarnish, um, whereas gold and aluminum uh, do not. But uh, gold and copper um, pretty much absorb um, this part of the color wheel, so one half and maybe up to almost two thirds of the color wheel. So they're not necessarily uh, good um, choices for a mirror. And so early mirrors were actually silver and aluminum actually is a, is a common uh, material for mirrors as well. And aluminum generally doesn't tarnish. Um, so it's a pretty good choice for mirror for making a mirror. Um, so absorption of the color, um, our old friend, the color wheel, um, you can make wardrobe choices. I often do. Um, anywho, let's uh, move on to the next slide. So, uh, refraction slash transmission. And um, you see this oftentimes, and, and I, 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 I'm beating myself a little bit for not putting a picture of a, if you've ever stuck a pole in a swimming pool, you see a refraction and it appears like the pole is bent. And it's the interaction of, of a light, the difference in interaction of light between air and water. Um, so refraction um, occurs um, if, you get through your entire media and light passes through, then you'll get transmission. So you can actually have some refraction in your media, um, even when you're transmitting the, uh, the light through. Um, so refraction transmission, if you've ever stuck a pole in a swimming pool, um, you've, uh, you've seen this. Um, absorption, 
Um, it's basically when um, material absorbs light, you can actually use it to create a wavelength filter. So let's go back up here. So if I have a thin sheet of copper and I'll, I'm absorbing, you know, one half to two thirds of the color wheel, so I can actually make a, a, a red, make it so there's a red pass-through filter. So I can block um, all the uh, blue and green and stuff like that. So you can make a, make a filter that way. So you can make a wavelength filter um, is what I'm trying to say uh, with this little slide. Uh, polarization uh, kind of becomes a, um, excuse me, I, I shut myself off when I was changing my pointer. Uh, polarization becomes uh, um, kind of important when you're trying to manipulate the light when you're actually looking at your image. And uh, in optical microscopy or metallography, excuse me, in uh, optical metallography, um, polarization is oftentimes used to spot inclusions. And uh, so you can change the wavelength of light. So you can shift it or you can change the behavior. So you have a, a wavelength shifter or you can change it to a circular polarization, uh, basically. So one of these is S and one of these is P. Um, and then you have a circular polarization. So um, quarter wavelength shift is generally what you do. Um, in addition to changing the wavelength shift, you can also rotate it. And uh, Olympus have has uh, these great tutorials. And I've made several movies uh, kind of using these tutorials in this uh, lecture that we'll see. So we can kind of see the effect of a, of a polarizer. And uh, so you can change the intensity of light. Um, if you start change putting too much light in it, it kind of gets blurry. So you can actually, you have to adjust your focus. And uh, this is, uh, these are very, very good uh, tutorials, I think. And so now if you rotate your polarizer, you're uh, changing the way or you're changing what you see. So you're changing the way um, the light's interacting with the sample basically. And so that actually brings out different things. And so in uh, metallography, um, you can play with a polarizer and then determine if you have inclusions or not. And so like sulfide inclusions tend to glow um, under the uh, influence of a polarizer. And here's kind of another example. Um, you increase the intensity, it gets blurry, adjust the focus a little bit. And I think these are really great tutorials. So I've, I'm, I've put the web links uh, so you can actually go play around with it yourself. It's a lot of fun. I think maybe I played with it a little too much uh, when I was making this uh, lecture. Um, so rotating a polarizer uh, changes the image characteristics. Um, you can highlight aspects of the microstructure that perhaps you're more interested in, whether it's inclusions or, or something else. Um, the basic premise of a polarizer is you remove indirect scatter. So you can actually clarify your image um, so think sunglasses. And uh, actually, I prefer not to use polarized sunglasses on uh, the bicycle um, because what it does for me anyway is it makes it so I can see problems with LCD screens. So I look at a lot of uh, liquid crystal uh, displays, whether it's my watch or a, or a cycling computer, and uh, the, the image becomes so clear I can see the defects in the LCD screen with, with polarized sunglasses. So I tend not to use them. Uh, when, I, when I'm riding a bicycle, but uh, I digress as always. Um, I got this off the internet, kind of showing uh, different interactions. So this shows um, diffraction, not sorry, excuse me, refraction, got ahead of myself there. Uh, refraction, transmission, and reflection all in one picture. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, you could actually use this as a beam splitter. Um, Shamelessly took this off the internet. Uh, they even left their watermark for me. Uh, Science Photo Library um, is where it came from. So you have reflection, uh, refraction, and transmission um, all in one shot. And uh, so I actually like this picture uh, quite a bit. Um, I've used it in the past and it didn't have the watermark. And uh, so I guess they've gotten wise to uh, my ways or something. I'm probably not the only one uh, using it either. Um, this also, if I didn't mention it, this could also be a beam splitter. And so you have uh, one beam and you want it to go to multiple places. Uh, you could have part of the beam go this way, you could have part of the beam go that way. And uh, so um, kind of an example of a beam splitter um, here as well. Just kind of thought of that. Um, diffraction. All right, so keep watching. This is for me uh, to remind myself in the editing process to uh, put in my diffraction experiment. And uh, so keep watching um, and uh, we'll move on and 
my my time i'm moving on to the next slide but there's going to be a diffraction experiment for you guys to watch uh right here all right so we're talking about um, light behaving as a wave um, we're going to do a quick uh, diffraction experiment and uh, what i have is i have my uh, diffraction grading and um, i'll show it to you right here um, I got it at a museum gift shop uh, for like 50 cents. It's actually kind of cool. Um, the diffraction grading, again, is just a repeating structure uh, that gives us diffraction patterns. Um, we use diffraction uh, to characterize materials um, on an X-ray diffractometer. Uh, if you think metals have a repeating crystal structure, or materials, the crystalline, have a repeating crystal structure, and, and uh, you, can, you can learn some stuff um, about the materials that way. Um, so let's kind of conduct this diffraction experiment. And what I have is I have my light source. It's uh, this LED flashlight that's rolling away. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I need a recording instrument. And so for that, I have my, my cell phone. So camera recording a camera. I'm going to put my diffraction grating on the back of my phone here. Just kind of hold it in place. A little complicated. Not too complicated. We'll illuminate things, and let's see. We have a diffraction pattern. We can either line everything up. There we go. We got a good one there. And uh, so that repeating pattern doesn't come out quite so good. There we go. We got it. Is uh, our diffraction pattern. Um, and so again, this is evidence that uh, light uh, behaves as a wave. We're actually getting a nice color diffraction pattern, uh, which is really kind of cool. All right. So basic optics time. Um, we have our so-called principal ray diagram, and I think uh, you're first exposed to this perhaps in physics. Um, I, I'm getting older. I do not remember when I first um, um, experienced this, but you have your lens. Let me switch to laser pointer mode. Um, you have your lens, and then you have your image, and then you have what you're looking at, and somehow it's being magnified, right? How's it being magnified? The magic of optics. And uh, so the distance between your lens and your object is the object distance O. Uh, the distance between your lens and your image is the image distance I. Um, there's going to be a focal point F. And uh, these are kind of the key variables. And um, I kind of gave away the punchline down here. Uh, but there's some relationship. So there's always a ratio if you have a quote unquote perfect lens. Um, and a lot of times reality doesn't meet the theoretical. You know, you see that a lot in life. Um, so we were, we deal with these equations quite often. So 1 over I plus 1 over O equals 1 over F. And then a magnification is I over O. So 1 over the image distance plus 1 over the object distance uh, gives you the focal length of your lens. And again, this is for a perfect lens. Um, there could be lens aberrations like astigmatism. I have that in my left eye, one of the reasons I wear glasses. Um, anyway, the magnification equation is I over O. Okay, so image distance over object distance uh, gives you your magnification. Um, how do we get the magnification equation? And I don't know, I kind of abbreviated it, but mag magnification. Um, so 1 over I plus 1 over O equals 1 over F. And so we already know um, M equals I over O. So you kind of derive itself. <laughs> so I, I, maybe this is the worst derivation ever for me. Um, so I equals M O. Um, so you can write it 1 over um, M O plus uh, 1 over O equals 1 over F. And um, so you can get um, M equals F over O minus F. And uh, so get the magnification equation. So if O equals infinity, I equals F. Anyway, 
probably the worst derivation I've ever done. But that's how we get the magnification equation. Um, can I have a problem? And so um, if O is 2.5 centimeters and F is uh, 2 centimeters, uh, what's the image distance? And so you can do that um, just by this relationship. Actually, I have it here. So 1 over I plus 1 over O equals 1 over F. And so I equals 10 centimeters. Uh, what is the magnification? I over O. So 10 over 2.5, so that equals 4X. So not the most powerful of lenses, but hopefully you get the picture. Um, what if the object distance is large compared to F? And uh, so if we have a larger object distance um, than F, um, your magnification is one. So the larger the object distance is, the less the magnification. And um, so we'll see that in a tutorial. I'm probably going through this a little fast because I know I have a tutorial coming up um, that I think explains it a little bit better. Um, but anywho, if you have a large object distance, your magnification is less, basically. Um, so for greater magnification, your object distance should actually be close to the focal point or should actually just be small. And uh, this maybe actually says it a little bit more so you can visualize it mathematically. I shouldn't be discounting my own uh, PowerPoint slides so much. Uh, for greater magnification, your object distance should be close to the focal point of the lens or the focal distance of the lens. Um, again, back to our Olympus um, tutorials here. Let me go to uh, this movie. And uh, so two things that you can play around with this tutorial, you can increase the magnification and you see the focal distance is getting less. They call it focal length, focal distance uh, interchangeable. Um, what's also kind of cool is the length of your objective actually plays a role a little bit in your uh, focal point, focal distance as well. And uh, I, it's kind of hard to explain with the principal ray diagram. This is actually a very good tutorial because um, it kind of shows the greater picture of an optical microscope. And um, so we can watch it again, um, kind of driving it home, higher magnification, lower focal length, or focal distance, and the tube length. So if your tube length gets longer, your focal length gets longer. And this also kind of plays in the grander scheme of things um, for another parameter that we care about called working distance. And uh, we'll see that uh, later on in this lecture. All right, so we have some equations uh, that we care about. And uh, this is the Abe equation, the Ernst-Abe equation. And it is the diffusion, sorry, diffraction uh, condition, I believe. So where you actually um, get some light through. So you actually have a peak width. And uh, Ernst Abe, I believe, was the thesis advisor for Carl Zeiss, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, it was uh, uh, Germany and Zeiss. Uh, we still see Zeiss and uh, I, I use a Zeiss a lens cleaning cloth and uh, lens cleaning wipes uh, to keep my optical goods clean. Not a, not a paid endorsement, by the way. Um, so the Ernst Abe equation is uh, delta equals uh, 0 0.612 lambda over n sine alpha. Um, n is the index of refraction for whatever reason, and I've never understood it. Um, the Brandon and Kaplan textbook uses mu don't know why. Uh, lambda is the wavelength of light. Alpha is a lens parameter. And uh, I was always taught that alpha uh, ranges between 7 and 60 degrees. But if you see some of these tutorials that Olympus provides, you get a little bit higher. So you get like in the 70 degree range. Um, so I might augment this. But 70 degrees, a little bit more than 60. It's not an order of magnitude or anything like that. Um, so it's still pretty close. And uh, so you have a light source, light shines through a lens and you get a primary peak and you get these kind of secondary peaks. 
And if I were to draw the wall that this hits, um, you would get kind of a dot and then a ring. And um, I might want to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but the big thing is you get a central uh, point with a peak and that peak width is delta. And uh, this delta um, kind of becomes important. And uh, this delta is directly proportional to wavelength. So kind of keep that in mind directly proportional to wavelength because you can get a resolution equation now, which is the Rayleigh criterion. It's pretty much the Abe equation. And I think maybe I'm pronouncing Abe wrong. It's probably Abe, but um, that's neither here nor there. And so the key definition of resolution, okay. And sometimes people get resolution confused with magnification. Um, they went, a lot of times people ask, well, you know, what's the highest magnification of this microscope? And that's not the question you want to ask ever because you can blow something up again. You can blow something up. And again, if I blow my face up and put it on the Empire State Building, you're not going to know that much more about my face. And um, I have another kind of movie in this lecture where hopefully you can kind of see the difference between magnification and resolution. And why resolution really is the key parameter of any microscope, um, whether it's an optical microscope, a magnifying glass, um, a scanning electron microscope, transmission electron microscope, any, any kind of microscope, resolution is the key uh, parameter um, you should be looking for. And um, it's not 4K, so I really, it bugs me a little bit when I, when I look at 4K TVs. And uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of a sidebar Okay, there's, uh, I, I should actually put him up, but there's a, a doofus um, going around and he has these YouTube videos. He's probably a very successful YouTuber, probably makes more than me off his YouTube videos, uh, but he's talking about like 4K monitors and uh, he's saying that there's uh, more pixels in a 4K monitor. Um, the pixel density on a 4K monitor is greater than the number of rods and cones um, in a human eye. So 4k doesn't matter. Well, that's absolutely false. That's not how the human eye works. It's a, it's a little bit di different than that, a little bit more complex than that. We are not uh, digital, um, in our, our design, if you will. But anywho, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit far off the topic. Uh, let me come back to this resolution. So the definition of resolution, the ability to distinguish between two points. And, uh, here's the cartoon I've, I've derived, uh, to make this as clear as possible. So if you can't distinguish, uh, these two points, it's unresolved. And if you can distinguish the two points, it is resolved. And uh, I argue oftentimes with uh, microscopists, um, especially when they're trying to sell you something, if the distance is the center of your object or this space, okay? And uh, microscope uh, manufacturers actually sell it as this space, which may be better. I don't know. I have to decide my, for myself. Uh, but the Rowley criterion is the same exact equation. So D, distance between two points, 0 0.612 lambda, um, N sine alpha. Um, the only thing that has units is wavelength. Okay, so this D, the units is uh, de de uh, determined by the wavelength of your light, basically. So, you know, if you're working in nanometers, um, maybe you have a thousand nanometers, you want to change that to something else. Um, microns. Anyway, um, N sine alpha, again, alpha is the, the lens parameter. N is the index of refraction. You can calculate the resolution of your system if you know um, key parameters of your lens and also the, the light. So if I know um, the alpha parameter and I know the index of refraction and uh, we're going to get to uh, what this reduces to um, shortly, and uh, you know the wavelength of your light, you can figure out the resolution. All right, so what does this mean for imaging? So we have two things. So we have the Abe diffraction limit delta, and then we have the um, D resolution. And so there's kind of maybe a little bit goofy, but if uh, D, is equal to the Abe limit, you'll get this nice image. If a D is greater than the Abe diffraction limit, it might be blurry, okay? Um, but if it's really, really small, you might not get enough intensity to see it. And uh, so that's kind of the point, the punchline of this, of this figure. So if it's too small, you won't have enough intensity to see it. If it's too big, 
it will be blurry and um, I was doing that without my laser pointer so hopefully you saw my arrow but we'll, we'll do it we'll go over it again uh, too small you might not see it not enough light intensity Goldilocks just right you'll be able to see it nice and clear um, if, if it's too big um, it might be blurry so you, it'll be blurry uh, basically um, so that's what that means for imaging um, the key things though more practical in the more practical sense you can use this to calculate the resolution of your system uh, wavelength and resolution uh, so shorter wavelengths uh, will give better resolution and uh, that becomes extremely apparent when we talk about SEM compared to optical microscopy uh, visible light is in the range of 560 nanometers um, you want to think about limitations to the light source so I could get higher resolution if I start using UV light right and even my little cell phone microscope had a white light I'm sorry black light excuse me um, so UV so I could shine that on a black light poster and um, there's some things you want to think about though if you're putting off UV that kind of becomes a health hazard potentially damaging to your eyes and stuff like that so limitations to the light source um, also, if you have too energetic of a light source, you can actually damage your sample. And I share this story uh, from my, my semiconductor days. Um, I used to do a lot of evaluation of microscopy equipment, and Sony uh, was a vendor. And uh, Sony had made this uh, basically a laser microscope. And the laser they were using, they were very proud of this. The salespeople were very proud of the fact um, that they were using the same laser uh, that they were using in the PlayStation, and uh, which, I, which I believe... Um, is a green laser, if I'm not mistaken, but they amped it up and uh, they actually burnt a hole in uh, the silicon wafer uh, that they were trying to examine for us. And uh, needless to say, we did, we did not buy that um, instrument. But think about limitations to the light source. So if you're using UV, um, sometimes you might not be able to see it either, right? So you might have to use a different imaging system and... Um, Exposure to the light source could be potentially damaging to you, your eyes, whatever. So uh, think about that. Um, numerical aperture and resolution um, kind of becomes a key thing here. And so numerical aperture is NA. And so the NA of a lens um, is uh, pretty important. You can uh, manipulate the numerical aperture by changing the index of refraction of your media. And so you can have an air lens. So if you think about this lens assembly, um, you can actually put a media in it. And um, I'm a little bit remiss because I don't have a cutaway of, of this lens. Um, but um, air, water, and oil. So air, the index of refraction is one. Water, it's slightly more, so 1.33. And oil is 1.5. Um, so oil immersion lenses are the uh, probably the highest quality lenses. They're generally the most expensive. Um, this is from Edmund Optics, and um, I had another Edmund Optics product around here, but it's, it's okay. And uh, you get some information from your, your lens. And so there's a color code, and I think this is universal even on our optical metallographs um, that we use. Um, and uh, so black is 1x, and I think this is a universal or a standard code. And so this has a white ring, so it's 100x. It also tells you on the lens it's 100x. It also tells you it's working distance, and so we'll, uh, we'll get over that. And so cover slip thickness, um, this is telling us that it's a biological objective. Um, numerical aperture or slash immersion medium. So this is interesting. They're saying it's 1.3. So it's using a different kind of type of oil. And uh, the magnification is 100x. Uh, but generally, um, air, water, and oil um, go in this order. And oil is usually more. So I was actually surprised to find this. Um, bigger numerical aperture, you have a bigger resolving power. And uh, so Numerical aperture, according to my own slide here, is basically light collecting ability. And uh, you don't want to magnify more than a thousand times your numerical aperture. That's a general rule of thumb. Um, a lot of people that you talk to will tell you that the magnification limit of an optical system is 10,000 X. I'm sorry, 1,000 X, 1,000 X. And... Uh, the 
child biological microscope I showed earlier in the lecture advertises its magnification to be 1200x. So it's kind of breaking that. Um, so it's general rule of thumb. Things are, are not always absolute in the world of microscopy. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, oil. Oh, okay. So yeah, I messed up my, my own my own thing. So the numerical aperture is, is 1.3. Um, not the index of refraction. So I thought I was directly contradicting myself here. My mistake, excuse me. The index of refraction, this is de is, is definitely correct. Um, numerical aperture is through this calculation. So this has a 1.3. Oil lenses can have a numerical aperture of 1 to 1.5. So excuse me for flubbing my own, my own slide. <laughs> excuse me, guys. So um, media, air, water, and oil. Um, index of refraction 1, 1.33, 1.5. Numerical aperture calculated by this equation. Numerical aperture is light collecting ability. Bigger NA, better resolving power. Oil lenses can have a numerical aperture of 1 to 1.5. Color code, kind of a key point here. Um, universal across objective lens uh, technologies. Excuse me. All right, so this is kind of a cool tutorial, again, from our friends at Olympus. And uh, let me switch my, my pointer um, here. So what's happening when we change the numerical aperture as we increase our index of refraction, we're increasing our numerical aperture. And this is actually kind of cool. I had never seen anything like this till I saw this tutorial, to be honest with you. And it's showing that more light is actually going into the lens and analogous to brightness on an SEM, the more light you get basically means a higher resolution. Okay. But don't get that confused with aperture size. Okay. So we're actually focusing the light. So we're mimicking having a smaller aperture by getting the higher uh, index of refraction. I used to have students do this in class. Um, so I'm a glasses wearer, obviously, but if you look through a pinhole and you can actually make a uh, quasi pinhole by squeezing your hand and, and looking, um, things become a lot more clearer um, with that. So you can actually in, in improve um, your own optics just by looking through a small hole should you lose your glasses. Um, but again, this is a very good tutorial. Um, I'll point it out again. So I'm going from a low numerical aperture um, to a higher uh, numerical aperture by increasing the index of refraction. And if you notice, um, they went from um, under one, so a poopy lens, to uh, over 1.3. So maybe um, they're, they're saying oil in this, so they're increasing it. So it's actually kind of cool, um, kind of seeing the effect on your light. Um, this is actually kind of cool as well. Uh, so changing the uh, behavior of the light with this tutorial and uh, kind of playing the movie. Boom. And so I, I was enamored <laughs> with the tutorial, so I paused uncomfortably. Um, as your numerical aperture increases, your magnification is also going to increase, right? So let's watch these other things. So your, your magnification is going to increase. So numerical aperture increases, magnification is increasing. And, uh, and I kind of said it before, higher mag, your focal point is going to decrease. So higher mag, your object distance um, is closer to F. Um, the terminology is almost a little confusing on the earlier slides. Kind of seeing the bigger picture is, uh, is extremely important. When your magnification increases, your object has to be closer to the lens. That's just kind of how it works. And we saw that a little bit mathematically. Maybe the terminology wasn't as clear as I had intended. Um, your working distance actually also is smaller as well. So higher mag, uh, working distance is smaller, your focal uh, length is smaller, and your object distance is smaller. Um, the numerical aperture also increases. So this kind of works together in the big picture, picture, excuse me, big picture 
of a higher numerical aperture equating to higher magnification. Big picture of the microscope, if you're running with a higher magnification, your uh, object distance is smaller um, and your working distance is also smaller. So kind of keep all that in mind um, when you use these tutorials and when you think of this subject of optical uh, microscopy. Um, other examples of immersion lenses, and so I always kind of talk about this. I used to quiz people, what do you think is, is an immersion lens you use every day? And uh, that would be your eye. And um, so your eye is essentially an immersion, an immersion lens, and it's pretty close to that of water. And uh, so you have your lens, you have your immersion uh, material, I guess, which is this vitreous fluid. And uh, this is the recording plane, basically. Um, I came from the semiconductor industry and it's, it's getting farther and farther in the rear view. So I probably will get to a point where I don't mention this anymore, uh, but immersion lithography. And now I think they've actually moved to E-beam. So they're actually making stuff with electron beam lithography. Uh, but immersion lithography, if it's not used anymore, was kind of an intermediate stage to try to get a higher uh, resolution so you could print smaller and smaller features. Uh, by basically either putting water on the wafer or running the wafers underwater. So there's been two different systems that I've seen used over the years. Um, depth of field and resolution. And uh, we have two terms. So depth of field and depth of focus. And uh, depth of field is the object side. And uh, I'll say this again. Um, depth of field is, is actually a detractor to optical microscopy um, because you have so much that could be blurry and uh, the depth of field decreases at higher magnification and uh, depth of field is, is um, um, how far the object can move and retain resolution. Um, depth of focus is on the IP side and it's given by uh, this equation. So D equals... Um, magnification squared little d uh, so it's def directly related to depth of field so how far you can move um, from the eyepiece or whatever and uh, still uh, retain resolution is is depth of um, depth of focus uh, depth of field is on the object side um i kind of painstakingly recreated the figure in the book for some reason uh, but to visualize this using a magnifying lens helps and um, um, so if you have one, give it a go. I have a tutorial that uh, um, shows this. I was going to put the movie here or the tutorial here, um, but I, I kind of saved it for when we're talking about working distance. So remember this relationship uh, between depth of, depth of field and depth of focus. Um, depth of field, depth of focus. Excuse me, I had to remind myself. Uh, depth of field and depth of focus when we talk about working distance. So remember it. So I kind of put this uh, danger sign looking a reminder. Um, I said it earlier, uh, depth of field is uh, one of the detractors of optical microscopy. And uh, so this is, and I, I'll show this slide again uh, when we talk about SEM. Uh, this is the same screw. So this is looking through an optical microscope and you can get a nice uh, image of the top of the screw but you lose everything else. So this optical microscope has a very, very poor uh, depth of field. And uh, so the depth of field is uh, eye-like uh, for, uh, for a SEM. And uh, that's one of the reasons to use SEM even at lower magnification. However, there are optical systems uh, that take an image at different focal planes and then stack them on top of one another. So you actually get a, a greater depth of field uh, but that's a little bit labor intensive, but I think it's actually cheaper than a scanning electron microscope. So, you know, if you're buying, maybe that's a, a something you want to take a choice of. Um, but I'll say it again, the higher the magnification, the lower the depth of field. Um, so key components of uh, the optical microscope. Um, so the imaging system, how do you record the image? Um, so if I wanted to record the image, I could perhaps put my cell phone here and take a picture or, or some sort of digital uh, digital um, camera and put that there. Uh, the stage, how do you manipulate this, the specimen? So this isn't a movable stage, but I can move the slide on the stage by hand if I wanted to. And uh, the illumination system, so what kind of light? So I can reflect ambient light through the slide. 
or I can flip this over and turn on the lamp and uh, shine that through the slide. And this is also the same on uh, our inverted microscopes, our, on our optical metallographs, and I kind of showed that um, earlier in the lecture. Um, again, another tutorial, and maybe I don't need to, to show this one, but um, kind of showing the stage. So this is clearly geared for a microscope slide, uh, but you move your specimen. So this is just a movable stage, and uh, our optical metallographs also have movable stages as well. And uh, so um, kind of some similarities between the optical metallograph and uh, biological scope. Um, the optical microscope. So here is a uh, figure 3.13 in the book and it talks about some uh, key um, components of the optical microscope. And uh, uh, this is also, I believe, um, kind of trying to show us a, a more of a biological based uh, microscope, uh, but the optics principles are uh, pretty much the same. So you have your eyepiece, uh, you have your objective lens, and uh, you have your specimen. And so the, um, well, actually this is, I always have to stare at this, I apologize. So this could actually apply to an inverted microscope as well, because you're bouncing light off up onto your specimen and then seeing it with your eyepiece here. Um, but anywho, let's kind of talk about some of these components. I always have to think when I stare at this figure. Sometimes it's not the most uh, straightforward. So your eyepiece is going to have its own magnification. Your objective is going to have its own magnification. Uh, but I'm kind of talking about the condenser system because it's all about manipulating the light source. And uh, so condenser lenses are used on uh, more uh, sophisticated microscopes. And uh, the condenser aperture actually controls uh, contrast. And you kind of see it in this tutorial. And um, kind of changing the aperture size. And so if I make it small, it darkens it, but it also decreases contrast uh, towards the black side. If I open it more, it lightens it up, but it decreases the contrast towards the white side. So even though this is a color image, uh, contrast is, is still kind of visualized as uh, the difference between black and white. Uh, I played around with this tutorial a little bit, as you can see. So they have different example specimens. It's actually kind of cool. Um, so this is a hemlock leaf. And um, again, showing the effect of changing your condenser aperture. And uh, I wanted to see a strained frog muscle. And uh, so low contrast, Goldilocks, high, uh, again, low contrast. So brightness and contrast kind of work together. And uh, you control the amount of light going through with this aperture. And you can kind of visualize that. If you've ever used a SLR camera or something with a variable aperture, this stuff is, is very easy to visualize. And if you haven't, you have this tutorial. So that's good. Um, I made uh, a special bullet point for the uh, condenser lens. And so here uh, you, you have different types of condenser lenses and that changes the shape of the beam of light. And so changing the shape of the beam of light um, is also um, important as well. And uh, so you have different condenser lenses. So Abe, um, Alphalatic, achromatic, um, an oil immersion lens changes changing the shape of the light. And so if you change the shape of the light, you can change the uh, image characteristics. And uh, this tutorial doesn't have um, changing the lens and the effect on the image. And I imagine that would be very, very hard to do because uh, uh, these condenser lenses are generally built into the optic system of the microscopes. Um, but it helps us visualize what's happening. And so um, higher intensity would be this Abe and this Al fanatic. Lower intensity is where we're spreading the beam out, um, like these last two. And uh, so you can kind of get the, uh, um, hopefully visualize the effective intensity of the light on your image as well. So you're, you're controlling the amount of light and you're also controlling the intensity of light by controlling the cone shape of the lens. The amount of light you're, con you're controlling with the aperture. And um, anywho, Magnification, so I've said this verbally uh, many times, and uh, 
the total magnification is the factor of the objective lens and the eyepiece. So your eyepieces are typically two to five X. And uh, I say that every time I say something like that, um, I see something later that, that says you're dumb, Dero. And uh, so my child's uh, microscope has an eyepiece that's 20 X. And uh, so that kind of blows us out of the water. But eyepieces generally are, are a lower uh, mag than your objective. And uh, your eyepiece uh, generally isn't as uh, fine of an optics in optical instrument as your objective lens. So your objective lens, uh, oil lenses, very expensive. Water lenses, less expensive. Air lenses, even less so. Um, so um, kind of the simple example, if your objective lens is 50x and your eyepiece is 2x, you have a total mag of 100x. And uh, you don't want to magnify more than a thousand times your numerical aperture. Uh, that is the limit of your optical system. Now, I'm going to pose this to you as, as kind of an aside. You learned how to make a micron marker in uh, the dimensional references lecture. So one centimeter equals one over mag uh, times 10 to the fourth microns. And uh, the optical microscopy video um, that's a supplement to this um, kind of shows you, kind of alerts you to making sure that the computer is giving you your micron marker. Okay, so what if you don't have your fancy computer to tell you your micron marker, which was how it was in my day? Um, you have to know the magnification of your image, okay? And uh, so you can figure out the magnification if you know your microscope. So I can't say this enough. Any instrument you're using, whether it's an X-ray diffractometer, whether it's a scanning electron microscope, uh, whether it's a, and here's my Edmund optics, um, whether it's this Hastings triplet, okay, kind of look at things with this. Um, you need to know your instrument well. And um, it's almost one of my pet peeves when people just don't know their instrumentation well. And um, if you know your magnification, you, you can make your own micron marker is kind of the point I'm getting to here. So if you know your objective magnification and you know your eyepiece magnification, you can make your, your micron marker. Um, you don't want to magnify more than a thousand times uh, the numerical aperture. And uh, that's kind of the uh, um, punchline here. You don't want to magnify more than a thousand times uh, the numerical aperture. So that's the limit of the optical system. Um, so if your numerical aperture is, uh, on that other lens was 1.3, um, you don't want to multiply more than a thousand times 1.3. So 1300X uh, would be the, the magnification limit of that system. Um, bright filled versus dark filled. And I have another way to explain it that I'm probably not going to share in this lecture. Um, but bright filled uh, d collects directly scattered light. The book, I didn't like its figure. Um, but the light that comes back up through the objective is your bright filled um, light. And a lot of times the illumination is said to be in the same plane as the um, collection. And that's actually the true definition of bright filled. Um, dark filled uh, collects indirectly scattered light. So if I have my objective here, okay, and the light's coming here and bouncing back up, that's bright filled. So my light source should be here somehow in the same plane anyway. Um, hitting the surface and bouncing up. Anything that bounces away would be a dark filled beam. And so dark filled uh, collects indirectly scattered light. Um, what does that mean for imaging? So in bright filled, here's uh, two grains and you have your grain boundary. And so this is intensity. So your grain portion is reflecting the light directly back up to your objective. And um, the grain boundary portion, the light's bouncing somewhere else. So the intensity in that area is lower. So you actually see it as a black line on your micrograph. Um, dark filled would be the opposite. So you would illuminate your grain boundaries and your grains would be dark. Oblique is so-called gray field. And that's where your light source is coming in and bouncing off from some other angle, okay? And your light is bouncing off from some other angle and you have a dark filled light detector. And I don't necessarily like this, um, um, representation of intensity. So it's showing your grain is bright and then half of your grain boundary is dark and the other half is bright. Um, but oblique is also gray filled. And I've only used gray filled in one application and it wasn't um, optical metallography. 
Um, so bright filled and dark filled um, are pretty much your primary um, light sources of interest uh, that you care about. Um, bright filled, this is kind of showing it again and also from the book. Um, so your objective is, is here, bright filled illumination, um, was bouncing back. This is going back to your objective lens. This is going off somewhere else into space. And uh, so that's why your grain boundaries are brighter. Um, this is kind of cool because it's kind of showing a recess. And so your recess theoretically would, um, or this ramp anyway, would, would be less bright, even dark, um, because of uh, the light material interaction. And uh, kind of what I've said all along here. I think I also repeat the figure caption, which is almost embarrassing. Um, the one thing that you need to kind of uh, bear in mind, and, and this, this diagram actually shows it more correctly, um, where your bright field, the light you're collecting is in the same plane as your objective lens, basically. And uh, the illumination actually is in the same plane. And so I don't necessarily like what the book says. Um, but the one thing you want to kind of bear in mind is if you're imaging dark fill on an optical system, it's much more complex. You have to bounce your indirectly scattered light into a way that you can see it, basically. And uh, I can't really follow this, I'll be honest. But the point of the matter is dark filled imaging is more complex. Um, working distance. So working distance is, uh, by definition, is the distance between the specimen and the objective lens. Um, it's smaller at higher magnification, which is kind of what we've been saying earlier. Um, the same is true in SEM. So you actually want to operate your SEM with a lower working distance if you're doing high mag work um, than you do if you're doing low mag work. And uh, try to relate this cartoon to depth of field and depth of focus as well. And um, let me... Uh, kind of get my pointer going. And so we go to higher mag, our working distance changes, um, our depth of uh, field and depth of focus also gets smaller. And uh, kind of showing it again, your depth of field, depth of focus gets smaller at higher mag. At lower mag, your depth of field and depth of focus are greater. And uh, so trying to use this to explain working distance, also I guess magnification, how it all works together. And that's kind of the biggest point. You have all these separate topics, magnification, depth of field, depth of focus, working distance. They all work together. Numerical aperture, resolution, all of them work together in the bigger picture of optical microscopy. And I, I'm hoping that um, it's kind of concreted into your brain um, through these tutorials and the words that are coming out of my mouth. Um, working distance, so I, I created this uh, little experiment. Um, one thing I will say is this USB microscope has two magnifications. And so it has a lens array where one becomes irrelevant and the other one becomes relevant by turning the knob basically. And so you have 60X, which is a lower mag, and you have 250X, which is a higher mag. And so I'll try to play these at the same time. Um, so you see what's happening. And so it's a little bit off, but uh, got to the working distance. So it's a high working distance before this uh, image becomes um, imageable or the, the microscope can see it. So high working distance, uh, higher focal distance, higher object distance at lower mag. So this is 60X and I should have added that in, but I'll verbally tell you this is the 60X. And uh, you can see um, you know, some details about the fabric swath and you can kind of see some of the, the way it's a weaved fabric, um, that kind of thing. Um, if we go to the higher mag, okay, so higher mag, smaller working distance. So I've gone to the higher mag lens assembly and you can see even here it's blurry. So it's far away. We're at close to the working distance of uh, the lower mag. Um, it's a blurry image, so it's not going to work. So let me try to get them at the same time again. And so I went a little fast on the, on the microscope image. Um, but now we've gone to a, a smaller working distance and we're at a higher mag and you can actually resolve uh, more details about the fabric swath. And uh, uh, that's it, I guess I messed it up. But you can try to resolve um, higher details of the fabric swath. So let me 
kind of play it and pause it. Oops. Didn't let me pause it. see ah come on now okay well hopefully you get the the difference or the the visual higher mag smaller working distance uh, optical metallography so another reminder uh, supplemental video is posted be sure to watch it it's made by our MME TAs give it a watch um, examples so we have some examples of uh, optical metallography and uh, we're gonna see more um, as this kind of segment progresses, or, or part of class uh, progresses, um, this is another uh, metallography cube, and um, um, this was a electron beam melted uh, uh, sample, basically, and so um, it was built this direction according to the figure, and you see differences in microstructure. So this is optical. My my uh, optical metallography uh, was used to create this, and so we can see differences. Um, from different viewpoints of the same specimen. And uh, we kind of see from here, it's almost a columnar-like structure. And uh, the question I want to pose though, so again, we're looking at differences between black and white. So contrast, very important. Um, how do you get this type of information? How do you get this type of, of contrast information? Well, first of all, you etch it, so etching. And then, uh, so here's uh, kind of some commonly used etchants. Uh, here's Bradley's favorite cowlings. He loves it. And uh, for this material, um, I used a ferric chloride etchant for copper. And so there's a lot of books, a lot of metallography handbooks out there. Um, um, the Bueller and also those uh, metallographic companies actually put out a lot of information as well. But you etch it. Okay, well, that's kind of the simple answer. Oh, I etched it, man. That's how I got my uh, grain structure to show up. Well, there's a little bit of chemistry involved and it relates to surface energy. And uh, so for this image, the, um, the, the contrast was driven by grain orientation. If you look at the scale bar, this is actually a photograph um, that I put together. I didn't use a microscope to make this image. Um, it was a uh, large grained, columnar grained copper. Um, so the contrast is driven uh, actually by the orientation of each grain. So whether it was 111, uh, 100 and the like, um, they're all going to have different surface energies. So different orientations have different surface energies. They're going to interact with the acid differently. And that's where you get your grain contrast from. Uh, for this image, uh, the contrast is mostly driven by the grain boundaries. You do see some um, grain orientation contrasts as well. This is Equiax grain copper. So copper and copper, uh, but different things are happening. The microstructure is different for the two um, samples here. And so the grain boundaries are driven, are driving the contrast actually. So grain boundaries have a different energy uh, than the bulk. And so they're gonna react with the etchant differently and actually more aggressively uh, than the bulk of the copper. So that's how you're getting uh, this contrast through etching. It's actually a surface energy uh, driven process. I'm kind of showing the book. So etching is a time driven process as well. And uh, so the temperature is the same between these two micrographs. And this is a little bit different than what you may do in uh, your Varma lab or, or any other class uh, with optical metallography. But this was showing that etching it for longer, um, it actually attacked the grain boundaries more. And uh, they're, they're saying you lose resolution of uh, the finer grains. And it's kind of hard to say that unless you're looking at exactly the same thing. I actually think this uh, is, is pretty good. And this actually wasn't that bad. But anyway, time um, played a role. They had to etch it at a high temperature um, so time, temperature, sometimes you have to ice your etchants. Um, I've done even electro etching, so you have to do uh, some uh, current, um, kind of cur electric current assisted etching. Um, so we're going to see a lot more examples of uh, optical uh, metallography, uh, particularly the results of the optical metallographic process um, in terms of uh, microstructure. Uh, be sure and watch the supplemental op optical microscopy or optical metallography video and uh, hopefully uh, you've learned from this video and uh, hopefully you know a little bit more about optical microscopy. So thank you all for your time. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.